Hello and welcome back to Making the Argument. Last episode, we discussed the reconquest of American culture. Today, what we're going to talk is the role that men are going to play. And honestly, the role men have to play. Otherwise, it ain't going to happen. Like this, this needs to be understood that regardless of what culture is telling young men right now about masculinity and about their role in the world, they're going to have to assert themselves because as frustrating as it might be when you are told that all of your masculine traits are bad and that by virtue of being a man, you're responsible for everything that ails the world. As much as it might be just insidious that people are telling you that you are not appreciated, that what you bring to the table is not only not welcome, but actually toxic right? You're going to have to choose. You're going to have to make a decision. And that decision is going to rest on this. Do you want how you behave to be dictated to you by fourth wave feminists that hate masculinity? Or are you going to assert yourself and do what you know needs to be done? Well, today we're going to discuss exactly what that looks like and more on this episode of Making of the Argument brought to you by Good Ranchers. I know there are a lot of young men like myself and Christian here listening to this episode today as well in our community chat. If you haven't already, I hope you'll go down to the link in the description, join our community there. We're having tons of great conversations, connecting with each other over these topics after the episodes. So if you haven't, we look forward to meeting you there. All right. As always, I am your host, Nick Freitas. Uh, unfortunately, my beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees, is not here today, but she is flying in and will be back for our next episode. Thank God she's going to restore order to the Freitas family and the Making the Argument universe. But we do have our resident historian and political prognosticator, Master Hines. How are you doing, Christian? Uh, this is I'm doing well, actually. I Good. think this is going to be a much needed and important episode. I agree. I agree. In fact, a lot of the conversations that we have had have influenced this episode as well as the way I think about this topic. And then, of course, we have our producer of producers, the Good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central baking. Thank you, Nick. Let's get right into it. Okay. So first things first, we're going to talk about a couple of things today. One has to do with these these five kind of categories that we've discussed on on other podcasts. Um, And and these are categories with things like uh, the professional, the physical, the intellectual, the emotional, the spiritual, and all these various things that all of us, whether you're a man or a woman, have to work on. But today, specifically, we're going to focus a lot on the man's role in these. But before we do that, I want to discuss a little bit about the operational environment we find ourselves in. I'm 44. I've been married almost 25 years. I got married at 19, married my high school sweetheart, immediately went into the military, and then very shortly after that, went off to war. All right, so when I look at my background and the way I grew up, a lot of times I hear people talking about the struggles of men today, and I'm thinking to myself, what are you talking about? Right, you're, you're not spending your formative years in a desert somewhere shooting at people or getting shot at. Right, you're, you're living at a time of, of incredible prosperity and, and you know, relative security. You know, what is the big deal? And my, my co-host and very good friend Christian one day after we had, had cut recording was like, I'm so tired of hearing this crap from people like you, Nick. I was like, whoa, whoa, big guy. What are we talking about here? He goes, you got married at 19. You met the love of your life at 19. You, you got married, which means you were in an environment where a woman wanted to marry a guy like you that wanted to be you know, masculine and, and wanted to go out there and protect and provide and do all of these things. And, and you, you know, you served in the military, you got some meaning and purpose from doing that. And oh, by the way, people love the fact that we, you know, we have these strong veterans that were fighting for us. And, and, and he goes, so I'm not saying you had it easy, Nick. I'm not saying you had an easy, I'm saying it's different. And, and I had to sit back and really reflect on that for a minute because nothing is easier than one generation telling another generation, whenever they mention the problems that they're dealing with, to look at them and go, well, have you considered not being a whiny little punk about it? Have you considered just getting out there? Because in a lot of ways, that's how men motivate other men. But something different is going on right now. And men my age need to understand this if we're going to be talking to men in their 20s or their early 30s. Because whether we like it or not, they did experience something different than what we experienced. And, and yes, some of them might have actually experienced the worst side. Many of them did not. Some of them might have experienced other issues. Many of them did not. But here's one thing that I think is fundamental to the sort of fight that young men are in right now that is very different from what I experienced. Because as Christian pointed out to me and was absolutely correct, is that when I was growing up, even though, yeah, we, we were dealing with issues of you know feminism and stuff like that, but we didn't have this woke ideology. I don't, I don't remember growing up in an environment where 
young men were told you're not supposed to be strong. You're not supposed to be brave. You're supposed to be passive. You're supposed to be docile. In fact, any of those traits that you have that you're seeking to develop that will make you a stronger, more capable man, that's a bad thing, right? You're a part of the patriarchy. You're sexist. You're the person that's been holding everybody back. The, the single defining characteristic of masculinity is that you're an oppressor. And a lot of young women have bought into this because the education system, as well as the government, has essentially pumped this information toward them that, that husbands are bad, fathers are bad. You know who's good? The government. You, you know who's good? The activist organizations that are going to come alongside you and make sure that you're finally treated the way that you deserve. And if you're growing up as a, as a young woman and you're hearing this, that, that wanting to be a wife or a mother is, is actually at the very best, at the lowest rung of female ambition, well, then you're probably going to, that's probably going to be reflected in the way that you date, in the way that you look at the physical relationships that you have, the emotional relationships that you have. And you're probably going to create an environment where you have a lot of young men very, very confused about what's expected from them because this narrative that they're being fed doesn't quite fit. And so now they're looking for some sort of alternative to that because that doesn't make sense to them. And because they've seen some of the men that have bought into it and they don't want to be like that. But then they see some of the other men that have rebelled against this, but have rebelled it in a way that just seems like this is all about the quest for power, for wealth, and for pleasure. And something about that doesn't resonate with them either because they know it can't just be that. And they're correct. They're right. It's not that achieving wealth or power or taking pleasure in your family or what, it's not that that's bad in and of itself, but we, we somehow intuitively know that it has to be in service to something. Ultimately, what men need, what men want is not only to feel capable and to feel powerful, but to also have a worthy mission. They want to be able to use that in service to something that they believe is great and true and noble. And they want to serve and sacrifice on behalf of it. And right now they're trying desperately to find out what that is because what they're being fed from our current culture and what they're being fed from a lot of our political class doesn't answer the mail. And likewise, what they're being fed from certain sectors of the media and everywhere else also doesn't seem to answer that question. So what we're going to go over today is we're going to explain that those instincts that these young men have and the challenges that they're facing in this world, it might not be the same as previous generations. But when we talk about that circle of good men creating good times or strong men creating good times, good times creating weak men, weak men creating bad times, a lot of people feel like that's where they're going up right now that the bad times are coming and it's going to get a whole lot worse and that they're not actually prepared to either prevent it from taking place or to deal with it when it is. And that's the whole purpose of the discussion today, to acknowledge that there is a problem and that in some ways it's more fundamental than the problems that we might have faced in the past. And as a result, that actually makes it, if we're being honest, it makes it more dangerous. Because as Christian pointed out earlier as we were talking about this, it's attacking people at a very, very spiritual level that is destroying their motivation. So that's what we're going to get into today. We're going to get into those five categories and we're we'll talking about what young men can do and honestly what they need to do. Because one of the things that you recognize as a man is no one's coming to save you. But the reason why is because you're the ones we call. You're the ones that get called to save society, to save families, to save your country. And having to do it at a time when so many people are telling you that you should just sit down, shut up, be docile and passive is difficult. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have to be done. And so the only way through this problem is through it. And we're going to talk today about how we actually do that and how we actually relish in the ability to do it. That it's not just a bitter struggle. It is actually something that you can find a great deal of meaning and purpose and hope through it. In part because of the hope you'll give others by actually engaging in it. But before we jump into that first one, as we go along this journey, one of the things that you're going to need is protein. That's right. 
Go over to GoodRanchers.com. Good Ranchers has a new deal going on right now that is absolutely outstanding. Not only are they going to give you 10% off, not only are they going to give you free shipping, but if you sign up for one of the subscriptions right now, sign up for a subscription now using promo code Nick, you're also going to get locked in to a price shield. What does that mean? Well, we've done a lot of episodes on how the Federal Reserve has decided to try to screw all of us with inflationary monetary policy. Thanks a lot, Federal Government and Federal Reserve. Well, Good Ranchers has said that they're going to be proactive in combating this, and so you sign up for one of the subscriptions subscriptions right now, 10% off, free shipping, right? And the price that you get for that subscription, locked in until 2026, right? That's a good deal. So regardless of what the Federal Reserve does, your steak, your poultry, your chicken, your wild-caught seafood direct, directly delivered to your, your door, that price is staying the same as when you locked into it right now. So go over to goodranchers.com, use promo code Nick, get the benefit of that price shield. All right, let's go in to the first topic that we're going to be discussing. So as you look at this operational environment, that was one thing that we always talked about within the military is un- knowing and understanding your operational environment, right? We acknowledge that that this this cultural influx is, is bad, it's corrosive, it's not working, and we want something different So how do we operate within that? So the first category we're going to talk about is the intellectual. And what we mean by this is, again, as a, as a man, regardless of things that you cannot control, right? You can, you can control the way you respond to things. You can control the way that you develop your own capabilities, the own, your own skill sets. And one of those is the intellectual. It's being able to effectively understand what you believe and to be able to articulate what you believe. And this is something that uh, Christian and I have talked a lot. Christian is is obviously when you know when when I think about someone that deeply dives into a particular topic in order to properly understand it, he's not just trying to figure out information so he can impress somebody or win a trivia contest at a pub, right? He's trying to understand why certain things happened within time. Jordan Peterson talks a lot about this. He was very, very intrigued by how do ordinary people suddenly one day give in to some of the worst atrocities of of all of human history. And what he realized was it's not all of a sudden. It's gradual over time. It comes from, in some ways, a lack of intellectual understanding of the evil that is inside us and the things that we need to do in order to prepare, in order to make sure that the traits that we have That when the time comes, we use those traits of masculinity. We use those traits of confidence. We use those traits of competitiveness, aggression, and a capacity for violence for the purpose of the good rather than the purpose of the evil. But that requires an intellectual understanding and the ability to effectively articulate. Because ultimately, we don't want to end up in the streets fighting one another, shooting at one another. We want to be able to win through the course of civil discourse and debate. But that's really hard to do if our side is incapable of, of making good arguments. So Christian, one of the things I want to ask you about on this, um, you, you obviously have a very specific skill set within history, but it's not limited to that. And I, I've, I've kind of been curious about this too, because history was always some, that was my first intellectual pursuit. It wasn't political philosophy. It wasn't even theology. It wasn't, it was being fascinated by certain historical events. Mine initially was the civil war. And then going beyond kind of just understanding the nature of battlefield tactics and strategy to really delving into this whole idea of understanding why did this happen and why did certain things happen the way that they did? So what what was, because I know history is kind of like, again, one, one of your first loves on the intellectual side. What What's some of the benefits that you've got from having really a broad range of historical study and understanding? I knew that there was a reason that we became good friends <laughs> because the, the same exact story took place for me. Like, I, I loved history since, I mean, b- before I could even learn to, to read. I mean, since I was, I mean, as, as, as long as I can remember, yeah. I've, I've been in love with history. My dream my whole life, and I brought this up in our previous podcast, actually. My dream my whole, my whole life was to learn history and then eventually teach it in a, in a college classroom and become a professor. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was similar to you in that I was really into, into wars, the Civil War being one of them. But not only, I was into both world wars as well. And one thing led to another, and, and I, I, I shifted over time from just studying battles. And, you know, you know when, you're, when you're seven and eight, yeah. you know, and you're playing with the <laughs> army men and stuff like that, you know, th- th- that's what you're obsessed about. History is battles, right? But eventually there's other things that you learn about that you find very fascinating. Like one of, my most in- one of the most interesting time periods in history, in my opinion, 
is actually the 99-year span between Waterloo and the July crisis. Mm. So from 1815 to 1914. There's, there's wars and battles that take place there, but it often gets ignored and forgotten because there's no big wars. Yeah. Like the Franco-Prussian War is probably the biggest, and it pales in comparison to both the Napoleonic Wars and World War One, right? But... There were so many transformative events that took place in that 99-year period. I mean, consider that at the beginning of that period, you're, you're living in a world that's very reminiscent of the one of the founding fathers, mm -hmm. right? It's within a generation of them yeah. declaring independence. And then when you get to the end of it, in some ways, you're still living in a world that's actually kind of reminiscent to the present world. There's planes and machine guns, and eventually a few years after that into World War One, there's tanks, and you know they're they're no longer using wooden you know ships with sails; they're using metal ships, right? And so there's a huge amount of technological progress, but there's also a lot of social progress. Yeah, like one of the most important things that took place during that time period is something that in some ways is actually relevant to today. And a member of our community that's very active, Andrea brings this up. She's a huge critic of the feminist movement. The feminist movement kicks off during this time period. Yeah. Now, this is first wave feminism, but by the time you get to the end of it, you actually are starting to have the seeds of second wave feminism being sowed. You don't have the um, women's suffrage that takes, but it, it, it takes place immediately after that period, right? Immediately after World War One. But you're you're getting to the beginning of, some big changes within the social order that had been in place arguably since like the middle ages. Yeah. Now to, to your, the other part of your question about, you know, how does this influence the way that we view things like the challenges facing masculinity today? There is no doubt. And you brought this up in your introduction. There is no doubt that physically we are safer than we were during, say, that 99-year period between the Napoleonic Wars and World War One. Mm -hmm. I am not being dropped like my great grandfather before me, yeah. who was a shepherd in Sardinia and got drafted into the Italian army at the age of 16 and sent off to go fight the Austrians in the Alps. I am not being sent to face machine gun fire with a trench in front of me, right? Mm -hmm. Um, although I guess in the Alps, they wouldn't, they weren't digging trenches. It was more scaling mountains, <laughs> yeah. which is yeah. still terrible. Yeah. Right. But <laughs> the point is, is that, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not being asked to, to take the Psalm. Right. Yeah. And so in some ways we can say, oh, physically we've got it better than before. I have an iPhone. How many, how many soldiers in world war one had those, right? Yeah. How many, how many men fighting the Franco Prussian war had these, right? Nobody did, right? We have electricity. We're able to, to have this podcast and then put it on the internet and get thousands of views. None of this existed 100 years ago. And yet, in some ways, there's, there's a longing for a, a, a era of history in which men were not only needed but respected and valued. You know, the other day I was reading, I was reading the, the speech that the French president gave at the very beginning of World War I, like the day that it started when Germany invaded Belgium and declared war on France. And, you know, he had, he had called, you know, the entire National Assembly together. It was, you know, an emergency meeting and they were basically like, you know, two arms. Right. Yeah. But the speech that he gave, I read this speech and I ended up concluding at the end of the speech. It's a beautiful speech. Right. It's talking about how France will be heroically defended by all of her sons and, you know, that carries, you know, all the maternal love of the country with them. And, you know, we're standing side by side. All political divisions are gone. We're one country facing this existential threat and crisis. We're being invaded by the mortal enemy, right? Yeah. And I read this speech and I ended up concluding that if the exact same thing happened today, if we were attacked, if the United States were attacked by China, you know, Taiwan or something like that, right? If they, if they tried to do like a decapitation strike on the seventh fleet to take Taiwan and we suffered massive casualties and it was obvious that we were in a war, hopefully a conventional one, I don't think that speech that the French president gave in August 1914 would be given today because it would be considered too toxically masculine. <laughs> yeah. And when I, when I, like, like I, I read these things and when I, I, when I see that, I'm like, wow, that, how things have changed. If a moment came where, where young men were required by the state to step up and defend their own country, I don't even think they would use the same, and it was an existential crisis unlike anything that America has seen, or pick your take of any Western country, Canada, mm -hmm. Great Britain, France, Germany, any of them, right? I don't think that the political leaders in charge of any of those countries would give the sort of speeches that you saw at the beginning of World War I that's dripping with, we need you to step up, young men. If you're in your, your teens or 20s, this is the most important moment of your life mm -hmm. for the sake of this country. And when it's over, not even when it's over, throughout the entire thing, we will shower you with 
with the support that, that you need and the admiration that you need to show you that, that I know that you are taking a great sacrifice, but it is necessary and we understand that it's necessary and we honor and value you. I don't think that's the message that would be given to young men at all. It would be given, oh, finally, you have something useful that you can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think when when I study, and I, there's a joke going around that when you get a certain age as a dad, you got to get into one of two things, either World War II history or smoking meat, right? Like it's, but th- there is there is something that I think is necessary about men studying history and, and understanding the roles that other men have played throughout society. And the reason why that's so important is because that's, that's part of our legacy as men in general. And what's going on right now is that this, this rewriting of that history to only reflect the negative manifestations of masculinity as opposed to the positive ones. Because for, for every story of a man doing something bad and brutal, there's another story of a man stepping up to stop that man. Gen- usually on behalf of his love for his wife, for his children, for his friends, for his country. But if you don't learn those stories because they've been eradicated from your curriculum or, or because they've been denigrated within the press or because they're rewritten by Hollywood to, to not even accurately reflect the things that actually took place, they're, they're taking something away from you. And you need to understand that's part of a strategy. One, one of the things that it's important to understand about history is also learning the history of how various authoritarian regimes have actually risen to power and the various processes that they went to in order to consolidate and secure that power. And a big part of it was robbing people of their history. And we're, we're constantly accused of this, right? But the, the reality is, the reality is, is that the, the society that is the society that we're living in today was largely built by, by strong and rough men that were willing to go out and civilize the wilderness or were willing to fight and give up everything to keep the barbarians outside the city gates. And that's, that is a history and a legacy to be proud of. And what they need to understand, it's, it's not done by docile and passive men that are sitting around, you know, doing videos about how, Oh my gosh, if there was a war day, who would go? We got stuff to do. Like I, I remember watching this video thinking to myself like, Oh my gosh, like this is, this is corrosive. This is disgusting. And so I, I think that there, I think there is something to be said when I look at the developing the intellectual capacity, starting with history, I, I think is something that appeals to a lot of men in general, uh, because we are looking for a legacy to build and a legacy to protect and, and understanding that even if you don't have that within your immediate family, you are a part of something that is bigger and that requires you. This is one of the things they talked about when, um, speaking of the intellectual, when they were talking about treating female versus male depression, they found that we were treating male depression like female depression. What does that mean? Well, it meant that it was all about coming together and making sure that you felt supported and that you weren't alone and that there was other people with you and, hey, buddy, we're here for you. And what they found is it didn't work for men. Uh, What men wanted was to feel strong and capable and to have a mission that they could use that capability and that strength in the service of. And usually in the the day-to-day stuff, that is personified in your wife and children. And so if you take away the wife and children, well, then you're you're not going to take away men's desire for strength and capability, but you are going to take away one of the most obvious manifestations of why that strength and capability should be used to protect the innocent, should be used to to protect something, to build legacy. And, and I, I've said this before to, to women. In fact, I was, I was speaking at an event in Los Angeles and I said, and, and the audience was predominantly young women. I said, look, it is not your job to make us good men. That is our responsibility. But I can't, I can't tell you what a critical role you, you play in making us good men and reminding us in the hard times on why we do it anyways. I said, I've been in times where I wasn't sure if I was going to survive with what I did next. I've been to war. And I can remember vividly thinking in those moments where I had enough time to really think about what I was doing before I did it and the understanding that I might not come home and thinking that I had to be worthy of my wife and children. That seems counterintuitive today's culture with like, no, 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 you have to run away so you can come back to him, right? No, no, I have to do my job so that I can be the man my wife thinks I am. So I can be the father that my children believe me to be 
so that when I tell them that I will protect them and I will provide for them, they are certain of it because in the moment where I could have cost me everything, I did it anyways. Not out of hatred for some enemy, but out of love for them. And so I, I would, what I would tell men on, on the developing of the intellectual capability is look at courses of study. Thomas Jefferson, there was a young man. I, I don't know if this is an apocryphal story. I don't believe it is, but I can't remember enough specifics to, to directly reference the, the people involved other than Thomas Jefferson. And a young man came to Thomas Jefferson and he wanted to be a lawyer. And so he asked Jefferson, who had a very extensive library, what, what he would recommend as reading material. And Jefferson was giving him a six hour a day you know, reading regimen. And what he noticed was none of it had anything to do with the law. It had to do with agriculture and philosophy and, and history and economics and engineering and science. And, and he asked Jefferson, he goes, why, <laughs> what, why is there no legal reading material and everything that you're giving to me when I told you I wanted to be a lawyer? And Jefferson's response was, is because you have to understand the nature of society before you can presume to opine on the laws which will govern it. And so I, I would tell young men that you're, you're always going to have a particular field that you're exceptionally passionate about. And it's going to be easy to study there. But again, one of the values I found in studying history is that it, it opened me up to, from the, the interest started in war, right? The interest started in military history, but then it went into the whole idea of political philosophy. It went into the whole idea of philosophy in general. It affected, you know, theology. I remember, I remember a, a man that I served in, in special forces with once telling me that I should, I should really consider looking at Christian apologetics because what it was was giving an intellectual defense for my faith, not just kind of the emotional one that I had grown up with. And it was critical. It was absolutely critical to my development with understanding logic, reason, um, so start looking for, for ways to expand your knowledge into these areas. You don't got to be a subject matter expert in everything, but having a, a depth, uh, a depth and breadth of knowledge is really important. And you will be amazed at how much it enriches the way you think about things and your ability to relate to both circumstances and people. Because once you've done a little studying, not just of the events that took place, not just the names and the dates, but the actual people that were involved in them and the context in which they had to make these decisions, it actually makes you a more empathetic and sympathetic person. It actually puts you in a position to be able to have a wide variety of conversation with people. And this is one of the things that I've, I've told all of my kids you can develop a, a whole host of skill sets. And there certainly are occupations where you can get away with just being a very, very sound technician where um, you, you can just focus on what you're doing and you don't have to worry about really communicating with other people as long as you're just getting your, your job done. But the vast majority of jobs, especially those ones which usually end up coming with a lot of influence, um, require good communication skills. And going through the process, a, 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 good, a good way to become more effective at conversation is to have something to talk about. And that usually comes from both experience and education. And as we talked about in our previous episode, that education can no longer be exclusively gate-kept by higher education, which will give you their version of history. We, we are living in a time where it has never been so easy or free to access just terabytes, terabytes of, of data and information that you can go through and study and learn. The amount of people that provide it for free on the internet is just incredible. And so I would, I would really say, look, nobody's standing in the way of you being able to do this. And I, and I'm not telling you that you can never play video games. You can, I'm not, I'm, there's certain things that you have to do strictly for entertainment. But what I would ask you to consider and to start looking at is that if you do have an interest and it could be historical, it could be philosophical, it could be theological, it could be based off of, of, again, engineering, science, whatever it is. Start to look for those programs that you see on places like YouTube where you're going to get a good balance of something that is genuinely entertaining. But after you get done watching it, you don't just feel like you were able to escape from the world for a while. You, you walk away having a new capability, having a new understanding, appreciating a new perspective. And then once you have that, seek out opportunities to be able to talk about these things with other people that share similar interests. Because in the process of having those conversations, you're going to get better at it. And the ability to effectively communicate is something that we need out of men. Because right now, all the communication seems like it's coming at men. And the idea is how do we effectively respond to it? And it can't just be all, I don't care what you say, you're an idiot, and then I'm going to do my own thing. 
truth demands an advocate and we need you to be good advocates. And so this is one of the ways that you can really focus on that. And like I said before, the more you study history, the more you study, not again, not just dates, times, events, places, but the more you actually study the people that were involved. And, and again, the context of, of what they were dealing with at the time when they had to make that decision, the more sympathetic and empathetic you can actually become just through studying. And that gains too through conversation. This leads us into our second category, which is the emotional. And again, there, there's this joke that, you know, real men don't cry, real men hide their emotions. And there, there's been a concerted effort over the last several decades to essentially say, well, that's, that's ridiculous. Real men cry. Let, let me say something about this that is probably going to be unpopular in certain circles. Um, real men control their emotions. You know, when Jordan Peterson says you should be the strongest man at your father's funeral, that's, it's not because we're not desperately feeling something in the moment, but this idea of controlling our emotions and, and not being given over to easily crying in situations. No, that's important. That's not a bad thing. Now, is there, is there, a, is there a path where you suppress your emotions so much to where they manifest themselves in really, really bad outcomes where you're not able to deal with things? Yeah, that's bad. And guess what? That's not masculine. I can tell you right now, I am, about, I am about to go through what will probably be one of the most emotional moments of my life, and that will be giving my daughter away to be married. And I, I can almost promise you that I will be standing there in my dress blues doing everything I possibly can within my power to keep it together, man. But she's definitely going to see, and you know what? I want my daughter to see in that moment that that moves me. Because there, there is a part of us as men, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of times the emotion that we're, we're most likely to display is either sarcasm or some other form of humor or anger. And that's because we don't want to feel vulnerable. But one of the things I, I've learned and one of the things I, I've really learned, not just as being a husband, but really as being a father, is that there is a side of you, there is a tenderness to you that your kids, that your wife, they need to see. And it, and it's not, the, it's not the blubbering, weeping male that so much in culture seems to think it is the appropriate expression of male emotion. It is the man that keeps it together, but every once in a while shows that aspect of tenderness and vulnerability to the people that are worthy of it. Your wife, your children. So... What I would say is, is that as, as you develop, as you develop that emotional, um, whatever you want to call it, control, um, cognizance, you should not be the sort of guy. I'm sorry, I do not think men should be crying at the drop of the hat. They just shouldn't. You shouldn't be crying at every single emotional thing that takes place, because one of the things that's needed from us is to be the ones that can keep it together in dangerous situations, in terrifying situations. You want to be the person that is focused and driven. And when something goes bad and when the gunfire starts, you're the sort of person that can keep it together and run to the sound of the gunfire when everybody else is running in the opposite direction. You want to be that guy. And most of us desire to be that guy. And that is going to include understanding emotions when they take place, but then putting them in their proper place so that you can go forward and do what needs to be done on behalf of the people that you love and the things that you love. But again, it doesn't mean that you don't feel those other things deeply. It's about asking yourself and developing the ability to be able to show that side when it's important and only to the people that have earned, to, earned an opportunity to see it. That's, that's, one thing that, um, that's one thing, too, that every once in a while, you know, I, I, I get questions from wives about things like that. And it's like, look, um, people always say, oh, I, I, wanna, I want a man that's not afraid to cry. Do you though? Do you though? Now I get it. Daughter's wedding. Somebody dies. Something is, is really moving and, and there's, there's, a, there's a significant gravity to it to where you want to see that crack in the armor. You want to see just enough of the crack in the armor to know that yes, there's a heart there that can be moved in a situation which requires it. But no, you don't want your husband coming to you crying every time something is, is harming him. You want him to be the strength in the storm. 
And, and if men want to be the, if you want men to be strength in the storm, that means that we have to spend a lot of time getting emotions under control so we can do what needs to be done when the storm arrives. And sometimes we're not going to know how to shut that off. But if you want us to be able to, this is the part where a wife, where children, they create that environment. We're close friends that can be trusted, create an environment where there are times where that side can show. So what I would tell men is, is it okay for men to cry? Yes. But nowhere near as often as a lot of modern society seems to want to tell you it is. And that's not about just being tough for being tough's sake. It's about the really, the, the very real challenge and necessity of men being able to control their emotions. Now, here's the other thing I would say. The emotion that men probably have the hardest time controlling is not crying at everything. It's manifesting it in anger. Now, there are times where it's perfectly appropriate to be angry. You should be angry. You should be angry at about a lot of the stuff that's going on right now. But if the moment you feel an emotion towards something, you act on it, well, then you're guilty of, of the very thing that we're trying to stop. You're, you're guilty of the very thing that we tend to accuse others of being guilty of, which is being driven by their emotions. Emotions aren't bad, but emotions are an invitation to thought. And the hard work that you do on that intellectual level is to prepare you so that when you get that visceral reaction towards something that takes place, toward an injustice or towards something that is good or noble or whatever it is, that emotion informs the proper thinking to be able to act in such a way that is appropriate and necessary for the moment. And a big part of the way that you actually develop that emotional is through the intellectual. It's through the interactions that you have with people. It's through fostering the sort of relationships that you can have. One of my best friends in the world, you know, Nate, he's the guy where if I got an issue with something and I need to talk about it with somebody, he's the guy I can go to. And part of the reason why is because I know he wants what's best for me. Now, understand something. There's a distinction. He doesn't want to just tell me what I want to hear. He wants what's best for me. He's going to tell me the truth. As a guy that wants me to be successful, that wants me to be the sort of man that he knows I need to be for my family, for my faith, for my country. And so if I'm screwing up, he's going to tell me not to throw me under the bus, but because he's on my side. And one of the ways that men can develop those strong emotional traits and capabilities is by fostering a relationship with other good men and by also fostering a very, very strong relationship with your wife once you get married. My wife has taught me so much about effectively listening to somebody before I respond. One of the biggest complaints that men get sometimes when they're having interactions with women is our desire to want to fix the problem. Because again, for us, we're like, I got to put the emotions to the side and now I got to focus on how do I fix this problem? One of the things that I think is so critical for the emotional development of men is understanding that oftentimes women see issues differently. And, it, and it's not just because they're being ruled by their emotions. It's because they have a different list of considerations to take into account as they go through a decision-making process. And just like men want a strong mission, they want to feel capable in order to go out and conquer something, women want to feel supported. And so one of, the, one of the greatest ways that a man can develop emotional maturity is by actually going practicing having healthy relationships, whether it be friendships or more intimate in the form of dating someone looking for a wife or getting married, of going through the process of, of listening with the intent to understand, not just with the intent of responding. And sometimes we have to put ourselves into to a, a mode where we realize that by listening in this moment, we're actually solving the problem. Because if the problem is she wants to be heard, then you trying to come up with some sort of solution that doesn't include you listening means you're not solving the problem. But again, that sort of emotional maturity is what is developed over time by first understanding your own emotions and how they're impacted by your own experiences, by your own education, by your own morality, and then understanding how that manifests in other people. So I would say as, as young men, it's important for us to it's important for you to understand how to sympathize, how to empathize. But it's also important to put those emotions within the proper context and within the proper place. Emotions are meant to inform thought 
so that you can fill your role and the role that is demanded of us as men within society. Hamilton, what did you want to say on this? Nick, I'm hesitant to bring this up because I'm struggling to flesh this out into a full thought. Maybe Christian can help me here a little bit. But we've talked about when emotions are high, anger, um, you know, you talked about your daughter getting married. But I think something that may or may not be unique to my generation and those that are younger than me is actually a struggle with the lack of emotions, the lack of passion for, you know, marriage, relationships, jobs, things of that nature. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, someone who could be listening to this that does feel that lacking of emotion wishes <laughs> that they could have that intensity for different things. And so I, I'm, that, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm interested in your thoughts on that and how somebody who is lacking that emotional intensity for the good things in life, how they may go about fixing that. I, I think that is a, no, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because again, this, 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 this is almost a generational thing where I'm thinking, you know, about passionately about all these things about my, my wife and my children and, and guys are watching this going, okay, cool. But I don't have those things. So I, I feel, I feel more numb to what's going on. And you know, Rudyard, who I, I love always yeah, referencing Rudyard him just Lynch, because, great guy. What if um, all yeah, he's the host of what if all his Nick and him have done some incredible interviews back and forth. And he's put out actually a lot of videos lately. He actually tweeted a few days ago, like, I don't know why you guys keep asking me to put out like the same video over and over again, <laughs> but I, I guess I'm going to have to. Yeah. And he's been talking increasingly about this crisis facing young men. He's done multiple different videos. The first one that we did was the, the backlash one, but he's done more than just that. And one thing that um, that, that he talks about, and he is a young man. He's, I, I think, 22 or turning 23 this year. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest problems that we have right now is there's there's no buy-in. And, and here's the thing. There's no buy-in not because the young men haven't bought in. They want to buy in. Yeah. There's nothing for them to buy into. And so it's not that they're at fault here. And actually, in some ways, they're they're a victim of the system, but they don't want to be victimized or they don't yeah. want to be treated like a victim. They just, they want to find a purpose in life, man. Like I, I can't tell you like the, the, the two darkest years of my entire life were 2018 and 2020, 2018, because you lost a Senate election <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and we got blown out of the water. And I just thought, why am I wasting my life here? And then in 2020, when the exact same thing happened and it said, except we came even closer to winning this time. I, mean, I lost by less than two points. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> And, and we lost, out of the water. we lost by a, a thumb drive of 16,000 mm -hmm. votes in Henrico County. And mm -hmm. I had my entire life plan built up to that point. Yeah. And I literally, since I was like 16, since, since I had met you the first time I had met you and, and you got me into politics, going back to what, um, what you brought up at the beginning of this podcast, I, I was not into politics yeah. until I met you. I was into history Yeah. and it was my love of history that led me into into politics because eventually you learn about some of the the worst atrocities throughout history, the massacres throughout history, the hundreds of millions of people that tyrants like Hitler and Stalin and Mao and Pol Pot have have killed mm -hmm. throughout history. And you're like, how on earth does something like that happen, right? And so, my interest in his in history is what fueled my interest in politics. And you you really cemented that mm -hmm. and made me decide that I wanted to go into conservative politics. And so, again, since I was like 16, I had this life plan all the way up until I was 26 mm -hmm. in 2020. And we lost. I had a 10-year plan. Yeah. I knew what I wanted to do with my life. And then we lost. And I was like, great, I'm 26 and my life is already over. Mm -hmm. I was incredibly depressed. I was, I mean, you you talked yep. to me on, on that election night. It was, yeah. that was the worst night I know. of my life. I was outside trying to make you feel better. <laughs> yeah. I, I was like, I just wasted my entire life. And you uh, know what? You were saying all this stuff and everything you were saying was true. And I was kind of resentful at the time. And the yeah. reason why, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring the story up because I think that there's so many young men, if they're listening, they're going to relate in some ways, even if they haven't worked in politics, mm -hmm. I think they're going to know what I'm saying with this. You were saying the nicest stuff ever. You were like, look, buddy, let's, let's lose together then yeah. because it hadn't been finished yet. But I already, yeah. I had done the models in my head and yeah. I, I knew my model, Joe and I had a, had a debate, you know, kind yeah. of leading up to the election. He had his model and I had my model yeah. and I knew that my model was winning out. And I was mad that my yeah. model was winning out because my model showed us losing. Yeah. Right. And 
And I was like, nope, we're going to lose because, you know, these counties already came in and I just, the math's already done. I know that we're going to lose. And you were like, well, then let's lose together because I was just sitting outside by myself. Yeah. And you were trying to cheer me up. You were trying to be like, it's not the end of the world. And I was like, no, it is the end of the world. Like, like it, it, it it's over. And the entire time you were saying this, I was mad at you. And I, w- I felt resentful. And the reason why was because I was like, here's this, this guy that already, I, I understand that everything I'm saying yeah. is not, I, <laughs> I get I, it. I, get I love it. you. I love you to death. You yeah. just have to understand where I, where I was coming from at the time. Sure. Right. And, and I was like, here's this guy that already got his, has a beautiful wife a, a fantastic family. He he's built a career. He, you know, is a decorated veteran. He's done everything. And he just lost an election. But you know what? He's still got a family to go to, you know, go to tomorrow. He still has a career that he can have. He's got millions of people that follow him. Even at this point, Mm -hmm. people know who he is. He's got a bright future ahead of him. He could always run for something else in the future and possibly win. And even if he doesn't, he doesn't need politics. He can do anything he wants in his life. He's already got the resume, got the family. He got his. And he's telling me, a 26-year-old who has nothing and just lost his only chance of having something, something to build for himself, it's going to be okay. Who are you to tell me it's going to be okay when you already got yours and I'm sitting here with nothing Mm -hmm. and I'm a loser. You lost this election, but you're still a winner in life and I'm a loser. Mm -hmm. And that was the thought process that I was, that I was in at the time. And I feel guilty for, for, for feeling that way. But the reason I bring this up is because quite frankly, I think there's a lot of young men that, that feel this way where it's like, they feel like somebody, their parents or their grandparents or even strangers telling them, it'll be okay, or you need to do this, or you need to do that. And they're probably sitting there thinking, oh, great. The people that already got theirs, the people that already succeeded in life, the people that already have the beautiful wife or kids or house or career or whatever are telling me it'll be okay. I have nothing. And every every message that's being sent throughout every aspect of society, the Leviathan, all the different cultural shaping institutions Mm -hmm. from the government to Hollywood, the media, Silicon Valley, they're all saying, we don't want you and you're the source of all evil and you're an oppressor. They won't hire me because of DEI or they discriminate against me within schools. You know, they're already only 40% of college students are men. They discriminate against you within government programs. My own government discriminates against me. The private sector discriminates against me. Academia says that I'm the source of all evil and I don't even have a house and I don't have a wife and I don't have kids and I don't have a career because I'm 23 Mm -hmm. and I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. And instead I'm just watching TikTok or YouTube. And you, and you would fought like, it's, it's not as if, it's not as if you were sitting back, just letting all of this happen. Like you had thrown yourself into something, right? It's the whole idea of like, no, no, no. I did what I was told to do. I found something I was passionate about. I worked on it. I studied it. I became very good at it. And, and now here we are and we're, we're losing by less than two points. And I don't know what the hell happens next. And, and again, I got some guy that you know, again, he can lose this tomorrow and he's still got all this other stuff. I lose this tomorrow and I don't know what I do the next day. Yes. And and, yeah. and it was so incredibly depressing. It was soul crushing. Yeah. It was soul crushing. And, and I, my, my, the reason that I bring up this story is because I've been there. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm no longer in my twenties. I just celebrated my 30th birthday a week ago, but like, I, I know, I know what it's like for a lot of these, these men that are going through this and, and and they're turning off of good advice because they're seeing that some of the advice is coming from people that it, from their perspective already got theirs. Mm-hmm. What I would like to say, and, and look, I'm, I'm not there yet. I don't have a house. I don't have a wife. I mm-hmm. don't have kids. So I, I'm still not there yet. I think I'm, I, I think I'm moving in the right direction in terms of my career, but I'm definitely not there yet. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I bring this up because somebody needs to tell these, these, these young men, even though they're only five to 10 years younger than me or 15 at most, like I, I get it. Mm -hmm. I totally understand where you're coming from, but I do have to say that the best piece of advice that I can give you is don't destroy yourself because there's already enough forces out there in the world that are trying to do that for you. I, I think that's an excellent point. Um, and, and look now, now, I mean, you telling me about that, that moment. I mean, I here I think I'm out there and I'm, I'm, Hey buddy, we're going to be all right. Right. When in reality, it was just like, dude, I, I don't think you get, how, I don't think you get that this night means very different things for us. Um, and that's fair. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I think to your point and to Hamilton's point, um, I mean, the only thing that I can say to young men is that I think there is a reason why we've entered into this kind of like brave new world stage where it, it is about doling your emotions. 
It is about, you know, take this, smoke that, watch this. And it, and it's like, here, here's, here's porn, here's pot, here's a pill, you know, here, here's whatever it is to keep you. And, and you see, it even starts within the school system. Oh, you're rowdy. You can't sit still. Right. It, it's this idea of, of we have systems that were not that are not suited for a lot of young boys. And then these young boys end up thinking there's something wrong with them. And, and then, you know, it, it, here's some pharmaceuticals to take. Right. Or or here's something to distract you away from the things that you feel like you're never going to be able to have. And it, it's just a, a never ending stream of these little cheap dopamine hits. And and the result is that I th- I think that I think that young men have been put in a position where it, it's almost it is intentional at this point to where they are trying to dull your emotions, because again, if they're convinced that you're evil and bad, well, the, and if a lot of times when men are frustrated, their their emotions manifest in anger. Well, the last thing we want is a bunch of you know frustrated, angry males. So let's dope them up, let's porn them up, and and then you know, okay, and that, that'll be fine. At least that'll keep them docile. And it's like, no, no, it, it, maybe for a time, but at some point, there's going to be a backlash to that. Well, they're starting to get red pilled, right? Yeah. And, and and I don't just mean that in the positive sense, although some of them are in, in the positive yeah. sense getting red pilled, but some of them are also getting red pilled in a very negative sense. Yeah. And there's there's been a lot of discussion on places like X and YouTube about this this crisis that so many young men are facing. And it's ultimately, it's a crisis of nihilism, of purposelessness. Mm-hmm. Somebody brought up once, and... It sounds unfair, but if, if you think about it, it is correct, and, and it's arguably unfair to everybody. But somebody brought up once that, you know, two things. Men are human doings, and women are human beings mm-hmm. in the sense that women have, have value simply by existing, whereas men have to go and build value for themselves. Mm-hmm. Another way to put it that somebody once brought up, and I can't remember who, but somebody once brought up that Women are beauty creatures and men are doing creatures. Mm-hmm. And we are in some ways cursed by, by biology in different ways. Women sometimes resent being objectified, but men also are objectified in an entirely different way if you think about it. Women are resentful, not all of them, but, but many women are resentful about being objectified by their physical looks, right? You know, being used as eye candy, being sexualized and stuff like that. But men are also objectified. Mm -hmm. They're objectified in the sense of what value do you bring to the table? What have you done? What have you contributed? Have have you built something? Have you made something of yourself? Oh, and by the way, we're not going to allow you to do those things because that's toxic masculinity and you're the source of all evil and you're an oppressor. But men are also objectified. They're objectified as being oppressors. They're objectified as being the bad guys by society. It's an entirely different type of, of objectification. And it's in some ways a more nefarious form of objectification because increasingly in the post-Great Awakening, it's now considered extremely taboo to objectify women at all. Mm-hmm. But it's actually a moral a, imperative and good to objectify men in the way that they've been objectified. And so it's not that, that one sex has it better than the other. It's that we are both cursed by biology in different ways. Yeah. And sometimes we resent that and we revolt against it. But biology is what biology is, unfortunately. And the, the way around this is not to revolt against it or be upset. The way around it is, unironically, the way around it is actually to be the best man yeah. you can be and to be the best woman that you can be, to embody the, the absolute... As, as perfect as, and we're all flawed humans, so it will never be entirely perfect, but embody as perfect as possible the ideal form of masculinity and femininity. And we're not doing that currently. In fact, we're rebelling against that. And when it comes to men, we're not even allowed to, to aspire to that because it's considered toxic. And so instead, what you're seeing is the only, the only acceptable outlet is the manifestation of a negative form of masculinity that's universally condemned and it doesn't matter that it's universally condemned because they they adore being universally condemned so it's it's the okay fine society wants to tell me that i'm all these things then i will be all these all those things yeah Uh, you you will see you will see how many you will see how all those things i can actually be and that that's like that's the villain story in like every comic book right like oh you're gonna treat me like a villain let me show you how villainous i can be you know i have a quote that i want to read off to you i I've, i've had it written down for a while because when i when i read it i was like wow I'm going to ask you to um, uh, guess who who said this quote. Mm-hmm. It's very it's very quick. 
Today, I can only assure these gentlemen that thanks to the brutal education with which the democracies favored us for 15 years, we are completely hardened to all attacks of sentiment. That last part's the most important part. We are completely hardened to all attacks of sentiment. I don't know. Adolf Hitler. Oh. January 1939. Wow. Nine months before he started World War II. Yeah. He was giving a speech. It's actually a very famous speech. He was giving a speech about the, the state of Europe, and he was talking about, you know, he was hinting at all the terrible things that they were going to do to the Jewish people in Germany. They had already done many of them, right? Yeah. And he was talking about how, oh, these Western democracies are talking about how we shouldn't do this. Well, they should take them in. And because they're they're not, and some of them weren't, unfortunately, but because they're not, they're actually proving our point. And they're saying, you need to be humane or you need to be, you, you know, you need to act like this and that. And then he pointed out, well, thanks to the way, he basically the point that he was making was thanks to the way that you, France and Britain, and arguably yeah. the United States, but especially France and Britain, have treated us for the last 15 years post Treaty of Versailles. We're totally hardened to all attacks of sentiment. When I read that line, I was like, dang. That in some ways, that's almost like a a a cry for we have become radicalized and become evil because of, of the way that we were treated by the Western allied powers post Versailles. There's, there's so much stuff that's been written about how the German people became radicalized mm -hmm. after world war one because of the way that they were treated by the victorious allies and how the treaty of Versailles contributed heavily towards the emergence of the Nazis. And in that speech, in some ways, it's kind of revealing that Oh, you want to, you know, pull on heartstrings? Well, there's no heartstrings left for you to pull on. Yeah. I, I think I, I think here's what's important about this. I think this goes to both what Hamill was saying and what you were saying as well. The, the question is, all right, we, obviously emotions are a part of existence. If, if the people that are trying to dumb you down, if the people that, um, well, let me put it this way. Don't take emotional advice or any advice that for that matter from the people that have branded you their enemy. And if they're the ones that want you dumbed down, if they're the ones that, that want you in this particular state of like utter nihilism and, and defeat, well then rejecting that and fighting against it is a necessity. The question is, is how do you do it? And how do you do it without becoming that? Yes. Right. Cause that's yes. the worst possible manifestation of it is when now you say the only em emotion I have left is contempt and now you're going to see that I can be the worst possible version of what you've said I'm going to be because I'm not I'm not putting up with this anymore. And I, and I think one of the most important emotional development skills and imperatives for men is one you have to be very very careful on who you surround yourself with. You have to be very very careful on, on the potential echo chambers that you put yourself in. You, you have to be, Jordan Peterson said this once that I thought was really, really powerful. He goes, you, you can't just be careful with who you choose, share bad news with. You have to be careful on who, who you share good news with. Because sometimes the most painful thing that you will experience is when you are excited about finally getting that victory and you've got that person that you think is your friend that is now running you down or minimizing it because they feel like they're in competition with you or whatever else it might be. And so finding that core group of people that actually share common values, it can't just be common interests. We're going to get to this on, on the final point that we're going to hit today. And I can't emphasize how important that point is. It's not good enough to just have common interests. You have to be surrounding yourself with people with common values because someone that shares the, the common values and someone that is committed to truth, when, when you are feeling depressed, when you are feeling defeated, when you are feeling angry or whatever else it is, they're not just going to come in and reinforce whatever your emotion is. They're going to try to help you target into why that emotion is felt and then to find the productive outlet to actually address what caused it. And that's critical. And, and you can't get that by constantly going back out and listening to the people that hate you or, or listening to the people that are just saying, yes, weaponize that emotion, and then we're going to go use it to get those guys. Right? So th th that's that's the best possible advice I can give to someone. And, and some of that is, and it, and it can't just be your peer group. This is the other thing that I think is really important. There's a reason why younger men need the advice and guidance of older men that are a little bit farther down the track. That the job of older men is to properly understand that the experience that you had at their age is not necessarily the experience that they're having. But one of the things that is so one of the things that I think is so fundamental about these five categories that we're talking about 
and, and understanding your operational environment and why you need to do both, right? You have to develop the five, the, the categories, the intellectual, the emotional, the physical, the professional, the spiritual, because there's certain, there's, there's certain components of that that apply no matter what the operational environment is. There's no such thing as an operational environment where you don't have to be formidable or capable within those five categories. Now, how that will manifest itself can definitely change with the operational environment, right? Like it, it, it is wonderful if you can focus your entire attention on just building up things economically and, and building up things with respect to your family and, and all that. Sometimes though, you might have to, some of those skills, those capabilities, they might be necessary because it's a war. They might be necessary for some other sort of crisis. It, it's wonderful when we can put our entire capacity to just building up and making things great but sometimes we have to fight against the barbarians. But regardless of what circumstance you find yourself in, these, these things remain constant. You have to, and one of the things that's so empowering about it is it's the idea that these are things I can control. These are things they can't take away from me. Regardless of what circumstances that they put me in, they can't control how I respond to them or what I do with it. But I, I think it's critical that if we want to develop that, that a, if, if we want to properly understand why the emotion is there, what's the source of it, and what's the proper way to, to fuel it, to use it as fuel toward the proper outcome, you have to be surrounding yourself with the sort of people that will do that. And some of those people are going to be older than you, and some of those people are going to be your some, same age. Um, and, and, it, and it is about when, when you're looking for the people that are older, you what you're looking for is who is farther along this path and has achieved the things that I want to achieve. And it might not be specific things, right? It might just be having a family or it might just be certain professional goals. But who's done it? But most importantly, who's done it while displaying the sort of character I want to emulate? Because if it's just the quest for wealth, power, and pleasure, you can find plenty of people that have done that that don't possess the sort of character that you want. And what you're going to find, even if you end up achieving those things, which most people won't if, the, if that's all they're pursuing, but even if you end up achieving those things, you're going to find out that they were hollow at the end because, again, you're looking for that purpose. But you, you can't just surround yourself with people that are going to feed in to whatever the negative emotion is. And you sure as hell can't surround yourself with the sort of people that are just pushing you toward this nihilistic idea. It's going to be frustrating at times. It's going to be frustrating at times to hear this too shall pass and we will get through it because you want to be like, dude, do you even really understand what we're talking about yet? Right. And that was me. Right. I had to fully understand. I'm like, I'm I am glad you and I had the conversations that we have done today and leading up to this point. Right. And with Hamilton as well on properly understanding the operational environment, because I did not have uh, anywhere close to what I should have had with understanding that. But it in, in one way, understanding it helps figure out, like, what is the pathway forward? But the fundamentals remain the same. And, and that's and again, that's encouraging. That's encouraging because there are there are. There are a lot of people out there that are feeling this way, and there's a lot of people that have kind of gone th through it um, and made sense of things from which they originate, who is actually pouring into them, and then how do you surround yourself with people that are actually going to help you determine and decipher, this is why I'm feeling, this is why, this is how it's manifesting itself, and this is the proper thing to do in order to move forward and actually utilize them the way that they were intended to be used. And, and I do think that comes with, again, strong relationships with other people that share your values and that want the best for you and you want the best for them. Um, there's another thing here that, that strangely enough, we've talked about the intellectual and the emotional, moving on to this third category. This has far more to do with the intellectual and the emotional than most people even realize, and it's the physical. Now, I, I want to say something right off the bat because obviously we're going to talk we're going to talk about some of the importance about staying in shape, diet, things like that. Um, I, I have had people before that have told me like, Nick, I'm in a wheelchair. How in the heck am I supposed to you know do the, some of the things that you're talking about doing? And and again, going back to the under, understanding your operational environment, I am not suggesting that somebody that has a debilitating disease is somehow less of a man if they can't actually do so. They physically cannot do some of these things. I don't want to give anybody the impression that I'm I'm suggesting that at all. All I'm saying is that to the extent that it is possible for you, right, developing yourself intellectually and emotionally is important. De developing yourself physically is also important. And it's not just important for 
the, the, like the outward superficial component of this. Like obviously, you know, when, when someone works out and they, they, they feel confident about the way they look, that's appreciated. And we need to stop pretending that it's not right. This whole idea of like, Oh, you're fat phobic. No, it's just that it turns out that somebody that takes care of themselves is generally speaking more physically appealing than somebody that has chosen not to. It's not that everyone's got to be a supermodel. It's not that everyone's got to have the same features. That's not it at all. It, it's more about a question of, to some degree, self-respect, to some degree, understanding that if you want to maintain cognitive ability, especially as you get older, lifting weights is a part of that process. Again, another thing that gets talked about now is it's not playing games like luminosity on your phone, which are increasing your cognitive ability. It's stuff like going in and engaging in physical activity. For some people may be lifting weights. For some people may be doing something like CrossFit. For some people may be doing practical things within their job. But one of the things that you're going to understand is that when you are staying in shape, when you were, when you were, and, and I haven't always, like for a good part of my life, the military insisted upon it, right? But it's this idea that you feel more confident you feel more control over your emotions because when you're confident, it turns out your, your emotional state is usually better. Not always. I'm not saying it's a one for one trade, but it certainly contributes to it. And then again, the, the studies that have, that have been done that have pointed to the fact that if, if you want to maintain, you know, again, cognitive ability, clear thinking and stuff like that, there's a direct correlation between doing not just like running, like lifting weights and doing that. So, the, these are important for a, a multitude of, of reasons. Um, you know, it, it, another thing too with the, the diet side of this is, again, I, I am not somebody that, dude, I will, if Oreos are in the house, they're getting eaten, right? There's no, I have never once in my life only eaten two Oreos. <laughs> I know what the serving side is of Oreos. I think it's a sleeve, right? <laughs> like whatever it is, that's, so I, I get it. I'm not telling people that they've got to deny themselves every single thing that makes them, you know, that, that gives them some joy with respect to eating and whatnot. But maintaining a good diet is an important thing for men to do because one, you're going to notice that it helps your physical confidence. You're going to notice that it helps your, your appearance confidence. You notice that it's going to help your mental confidence, your emotional confidence, and all of these things are important. And one of the reasons why this is so important is because you have an enormous amount of control over it, an enormous amount of control over it. And I, I think that's really important for, for young men to be focusing not on the things that, and, and, Again, going back to what we said on the emotional, where isn't it interesting that, you know, we've got these people that are essentially trying to, you know, almost foster this depression within men emotionally and intellectually, they're doing the same thing physically. I mean, we saw the articles that were coming out that, you know, you know, home fitness is, you know, synonymous with fascism, right? And then, you know, like eat, eating a, eating red meat is synonymous with, you know, misogyny, and it's like, guys, if the people who hate you keep telling you to stop working out, go to the gym every time you see the article, right? Like, I, I love, <laughs> I, I laugh all the time at like the short sightedness of these people that are like working out and, and living a healthy lifestyle and being a normal person <laughs> is all fascist coded. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, like I, you know what it is? It's the equivalent of calling everything racist. Yeah. And then eventually the word gets watered down and, and it, and it lacks all meaning and definition. If everything that you don't like is fascism, <laughs> then nothing, everything's fascism. Yeah. Either everything's fascism or nothing's fascism, which is so funny because not everybody who's going to the gym wants to control the railroads. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, here's, here's the thing. I, here's the thing I would tell you. This should be encouraging to you, right? Because uh, again, getting a gym membership is relatively cheap or, or just again, doing other things that will make you more, you know, physically eating right. Eating right can actually be a little bit more expensive expensive. But um, here's one of the things I learned about eating better is that it actually forced me to learn how to cook more. Um, and I found that cooking is something that women really like. <laughs> For me, my wife, right? So here's what I would tell you on this. If the people who hate you want you stupid, depressed, and weak, then you want to be intelligent, right? It, it, emotionally mature and strong. And so again, when I, whenever I see one of these new articles coming out, it's just, for me, it's just an admission that they know, they know what a, they know what a potential threat to their objectives young men are if you're smart, emotionally mature and physically fit. And so take advantage of that because they, you're John Lovell, uh, 
we're, we're all big fans of John Level here. We've had him on the podcast before, Warrior Poet Society. Um, I, I was watching him speak at a uh, Homesteaders Conference once, the uh, Homesteaders of America Conference here in uh, uh, Warren County, Virginia. And he got up and people were asking him about, you know, how do I protect my homestead? Because he's a former Army Ranger. And he's talking about things from a security perspective. And one of the things he talked about was like, all right, if the end of the world comes, I'm going to tell you, you want to be in shape because if you're in shape, you can work harder. You can work more effectively. You think clearer. Um, you know, you don't, you don't eat as much, you know, garbage and stuff like that. Um, and you know, you're, you're more fun to procreate with. (laughs) And he kind of slipped it in there at the end. And I just started cracking up because, you know, um, John and his, his lovely wife, Rebecca, like very, very strong, uh, married couple, great relationship, but th- there's, there's something to all of that, right? There's something to all of that. The, the other part about physical fitness that I want to, I want to throw in there is, uh, what I call combatives. Uh, I think there's a big benefit for, uh, young men to be doing something, whether it be boxing, whether it be some sort of like martial art, MMA. I, I'm a fan of of boxing and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm not saying I'm I'm great at it or anything like that. If you want somebody great at it, go see like Tim Kennedy, right? Um, but I, I started doing this in part. I'd done combatives when I was in the military, and then um, I was talking with my son, and you know. <laughs> Luke likes certain sports and whatnot, but certain sports, he's just like, it's just not my thing, but I'm, he'll crawl over broken glass to get to the boxing ring. Right? Like he, he likes to, he likes to box. He likes to uh, do, do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He likes to grapple. And I was like, you know what? This would be a good thing for me to do because I hate cardio. I hate cardio. I always joke that I don't run because it breeds cowardice. <laughs> um, but but I, I love the cardio workout associated with doing combatives training. And I feel like when I'm doing that, I'm not only getting a really good workout, I'm not only getting, you know, good strength training in there, I'm getting good cardio in there, but I'm also learning something that's very practical. I feel like I'm, I'm doing something that makes me more capable in an area that I desire to be capable in. And again, it, it adds to that overall confidence that you have. There's something about, there's something that happens to a man when we feel like we can handle ourselves in a fight. And, and so many people now in culture in general has tried to convince men that that's a bad thing, right? That, that, that capacity for violence is what causes all the world's problems. Because even when you talk about brave men standing up to something, what are they standing up to? Other men who are violent. So if we could just get all men to not be violent, we'd be better off. Okay. First of all, you're not going to. So secondly, the, the only men that are going to comply with that are going to be the ones that then can't protect you from the man that didn't comply with that. So it's just absurd. It's stupid. But um, I would say right now, lifting some weights, doing some good cardio, it's going to help you mentally. It's going to help you emotionally. It's going to help you physically. It's going to help you, I think, socially. Um, And then the other thing, too, is that, again, I can't emphasize this enough. There is something about, like, I saw something in my son's confidence the more he started going to the gym and the more he started like going to, to MMA and boxing. Um, you know, now all of a sudden I come in the house, he's like, Hey dad, what's up? What's up? And he, he starts to move. I'm like, Oh, you, we, you challenging for leadership of the, the family here now? Like, is, is it time? He's like, no, no. But, but then I, you know, I keep my eye on him, but, <laughs> but it's, it's a good thing. Um, it, it is, it, it's beneficial for so many things. Don't let people, again, don't let people who want you dumb, depressed and weak to convince you not to go to the gym or not to learn how to do these other things. Um, and, and again, it's not because everyone has to be an MMA fighter. It's not because everyone's training to go to the octagon, but I am, I'm promising you, I'm promising you, you sign up for something that, that challenges you physically and mentally. That's one of the beautiful things about doing something like MMA, as opposed to just doing the gym is that when you go in that and now you're struggling with somebody else, right? You're, you're getting more used to that process and you feel more confident in an environment where maybe it's not controlled. Because I promise you this right now, I don't care how big you are, if the first time you've ever been punched in the face is in a dangerous environment, you have not properly set yourself up for success. I, I've done this with I've, I've done this with my son, right? Where it's like, yeah, buddy, we're gonna we're gonna go through this because the first time that you find yourself in a situation, I don't want you to be shocked by it, right? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of young men out there right now that the first time they got hit in the face, they wouldn't know what to do. And if you don't know what to do, flight ends up winning over over fight. And that's not the sort of guy you want to be. You want to be the sort of guy that can protect yourself because that's the sort of guy that can protect others. That's the sort of guy that can protect the people and the things that he loves. So consider doing that. 
consider doing that. I, I don't think I don't think you will regret it. Um, some gyms are better than others. Like we are really, we are really lucky. We go to Zamora's gym in our, in our, uh, hometown here in Culpeper. And one of the things we've been really blessed with is that everybody that we have engaged from coach Eric to the other people that are doing there again, they're, they're going to, they're going to roll hard and they're going to challenge themselves and challenge you. Uh, but there is this sense of camaraderie and this idea that we, you know, Hey, like we're doing this so that we can all be successful, uh, not so that one person can kind of dominate over the rest of the class. So again, finding that environment is, is really important. Um, that moves me unless there's anything on here. I want to move on to the next category, which is the professional. And we kind of break down the professional into two categories. There's developing skills um, that are kind of like specific to the economic realm, right? And, and the, the, the exchange realm, if you will, and, and getting paid to do something. And then there's also developing skills which are just practical and useful, sometimes for saving money, sometimes for a situation that maybe you don't anticipate, right? It, it's, um, it, it's all fine to have a, a ton of money, but if you're broken down on the side of the road and you don't know how to change a tire and your cell phone's dead, you can't, you can't pay someone to do it. So you got to know how to do it and, and developing certain basic skill sets like this, again, do two things. One, you never know when they're going to come in handy. Right. And, and two, it once again, adds to this level of competence and, and competence affects the way you feel, not just within that economic situation or not just within that practical situation. It helps in other situations as well. If you know how to do something you're actually probably more likely to keep your emotions under control within that environment and provide a sense of security to the people around you, that you're the one that has control over the situation, right? That's a great feeling. It is a wonderful feeling when everyone else is like, what the hell do we do now? And you're like, oh, it's okay. I got this. We're going to do this, this, and this. Oh, okay. That is a wonderful feeling. I, I remember there was this one situation in, in Iraq in 2008. Grenade goes off. We got two guys down. And then I run outside the building and I'm immediately grabbing, you know, our, our Iraqis and getting them online. And I'm watching every other Green Beret I had trained with, fought with, had barbecues with, doing the exact same thing with no instructions. Just everyone knew what to do. And I can, I, I remember that moment so vividly that in the midst of chaos, me and my friends were bringing order to it. And we were about to bring a whole lot of ass whooping with us as soon as we found out who did this. And we did, by the way. But the point was, is that there was something that was incredibly fulfilling. I used to joke around that it, that was a that was kind of a scary moment too. But if a recruiter had been there, I probably would have. I'd probably still be in the military because I would have. I would have given away as many years as they wanted in that moment because there was such a feeling of of satisfaction and being able to be capable and help bring order to chaos along with other other men that were trained to do the same thing and that were doing it in that moment. So when we talk about developing these skill sets, again, some of them are, are a little bit more economically focused, but some of them are just good skill sets to have as a man. And once again, you don't got to ask permission to develop these. So when we say economically viable skill sets, obviously there's things that you want to do. There's, there's careers and ambitions that you have. And then there's skill sets that are relevant. Uh, one of the reasons why we talk so much about the intellectual and the emotional is because if you're an effective communicator, I have found like Christian or Christian, you, you've been in this situation. I have found that if you can effectively communicate or articulate ideas, you can almost always find work. You can almost always find work because you end up doing really well in interviews and there's always jobs where they need people to effectively communicate with other people. I mean, has that been your experience? Well, I've only worked for you. That's so. not true. <laughs> I've only worked for you and a political marketing firm. It's funny. I've, I, well, I've, I've worked for you like four separate times. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> yeah. Every time I, I leave, he drags me back in. That's true. Um, every time he gets away, we find a new opportunity to entice him back. But, uh, uh, so it's, my circumstances are just different from other people, right? Because it's like, I'm, I've worked with one of my best friends for most of my career, but I will say that the ability to communicate and articulate yourself in a uh, effective way is in some ways underappreciated, I feel like. Yeah. In part because, well, you know, it's the modern age and everybody has an opinion that they want to spew on the internet. And mm -hmm. I, I totally understand that I'm being hypocritical currently <laughs> by saying this because... Because we do it for a living. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing this on a podcast, yeah. right? But everybody has an opinion that they want to say um, or share. But the the genuine ability to articulate yourself in a way that 
really shines a light on on what you can bring to the table before you're able to actually bring it to the table. Yeah. Is I think underappreciated in part because we've kind of cheapened the value of words. This is why Jordan Peterson talks about quite often about how he's he he wants to be very precise in his language and I am not very precise in my language quite often, which is a, a big failing of my own, but I will say that there is definitely something to be said about your ability to communicate because Think about it. Just step back and think about it for a second. The most important ideas have been able to circulate throughout history because of effective communication. Yeah. When you consider like ancient writings, it's something like 98% of all that was written before the collapse of the Roman Empire has been lost to us forever. It's only a, a very, very small number of, of documents, the most famous of which that are still with us. In fact, some things that are actually quite famous aren't with us. Yeah. A, a good example is Arian's history on the wars of the Diadochi, the, the conflict that took place after Alexander's death, it was hailed as, as one of the, the best works of, of history within that time period, that, that 40 year period after Alexander's death of any historian that ever covered that era. We don't have any of it. Yeah. It's all lost to us. And that, that was actually, again, that was hailed as an important work. And even that's not with us. So when we consider the amount of documents that are still with us today that were written 2,000 years ago, it's a very tiny number. But the, even though we lost some of the most important ones, we do still have like Plato's Republic, for example. Yeah. Or we do have Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, which, by the way, going back to your previous point about physical, he wrote Meditations while on military campaigns. Yeah. While he was fighting in Pannonia, yeah, uh, um, in the Marcomannic Wars, so like there's a good example of linking the physical to the intellectual right there, and so the reason that I bring this up though, the uh, like all these ancient writings and why they're lost, you might be thinking, Christian, where are you going with this? This is another example <laughs> of you not being precise with we your just, words. We just know that we can throw out any random word, and Christian can get to the War of the Diadochi within two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the the reason that I bring this up is because. These works that have lasted throughout the ages, again, 2,000 years, yeah. the reason that they've lasted so long is because they carried within themselves some incredible insights, so much so that multiple generations, you're talking like a dozen plus generations of scribes, this is before the internet, this is before copy and pasting, right? Yeah thought this is so important i need to transcribe it onto a new document now so that way the next generation can read it 50 years or 100 years from now because none of the original documents are with us right we're talking about transcriptions of transcriptions of transcriptions yeah. of multiple generations of scribes in some monastery somewhere probably in the middle ages writing down and copying word for word everything that plato or marcus aurelius wrote and they and, and spending dozens, if not hundreds of hours doing that, right? Putting in all that man hours. The reason that they did it is because the words that were being emulated by these people were so important that they thought future generations need to be able to read this. Yeah. And thank God that they were able to do it because now we can read it today. And so there's something to be said about, about being an effective communicator because if you're an effective communicator... You can articulate ideas that can outlet if you're the, the, the perfect type of communicator or the best. I shouldn't say the perfect. If you're the best type of communicator, you can articulate ideas that could outlive you by 2000 years. Yeah. No, I, I think it's I think understand when we talk about professional development, the, the communication is, is really important. The, the other broad category here that is obvious is the technical. Right. What can you what can you actually do? And we 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 had a huge discussion on this on the last episode about higher ed and this whole idea of credentialing and and really how more and more people are kind of moving away from this idea that, well, I have to have this higher ed credential because whereas it used to mean that the higher ed credential meant that you could do practical technical stuff, now we're not as certain. In fact, what the higher ed credential might mean is that you're really, really good at being an activist, but you can't do crap else. And, and so I, I think it's important for people to learn technical skills, both from an economic and a practical standpoint. So let me give an example here. So obviously within, within you know, our show, we, we require video editors. We require you know, sound people, all, all these things. These are, these are specific and technical skills that have a great deal of economic relevance. 
it, it, you see a lot of people getting frustrated right now at the loss of certain jobs or so, so sometimes it's overseas, um, whatever it might be. Here, here's what I will tell you is as a young man, if you are looking out now and you are looking at what sort of technical skills am I going to develop that will give me long-term economic viability, again, communication skills always make sense. Always make sense. The technical skills you've got to look at, what, what do you like to do? And what does the economy need? This is a this is a big issue. For the longest time, we've told people, oh, just follow your heart. Okay, and you might starve to death if your heart leads you in the wrong place, right? I, I remember um, you know, my, my oldest daughter and my, and my youngest daughter, they both love the theater. And my oldest daughter very early on, because the way that we talked to our kids, all, all three of them, both my daughters and my son, was, look... Um, when you're young, you have the ability to pursue passions in a way that becomes less viable the older that you get. And so there's something to be said for giving it a shot, right? Even if even if people are telling you that this is, yeah, you'll never be able to pull that off or do you know how little they make or whatever. Dude, in early 20s, you, you can do this. You got a lot of recovery time ahead of you and you don't want to look back later and wish you would have tried it when you actually had the time to try it. So I'm not going to squash dreams of potentially wanting to, to perform in theater. Right, even though I know that the economic viability of that is very, very low. So my my goal is to prepare my goal was to prepare my children for the understanding that you gotta be able to feed yourself, right? Because that's that's key. If you want to be able to pursue that other goal that might be might be a little bit more difficult to attain, but worth trying, you're you're gonna be able to do that better if you can feed yourself while you're doing it, right? So what sort of skill steps again? So my oldest daughter, she looked at, she goes, you know what? I, I want it. She goes, I love theater. I want to get married. I want to have kids. And when I have kids, I want to homeschool my kids. So what did she do? She said, well, for 22 grand, which she saved up and worked for and did herself, by the way, for 22 grand, I can go to a, a high end cosmetology school and I can learn how to do all of these things that no matter where I end up living, I can always make money. I can make money out of my house if I wanted to and if I needed to. Right. And it also gives me a skill set that puts me within proximity to the thing I love, which is theater. Because even if I couldn't initially get a job, you know, acting, I could potentially get a job in hair or makeup. I could do something like that. And since I know that the environment I'm going into is very, very heavy in networking and connections, putting myself in a viable occupation within that setting gives me all the things that I need to achieve my future goals. That is a perfect conglomeration of I have objectives. Some of them are easier to achieve than others. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give myself the technical capabilities to put myself in the best possible position to be able to achieve, achieve those more lofty goals while at the same time being economically viable to take care of my immediate needs. That beautiful. Like I, I can't, I can't ex express it any better. Um, and, and so these are the sort of things where you look at it, it's like, okay, what, what do I want to do? Now, my son is considering going into the military. Does he want that to be his end career? No, but he wants to build certain capabilities. He wants to test himself, right? He also wants to get the, you know, the benefits of things like Montgomery GI. So he's not taken out a loan to pay for, you know, um, um, trade school or, or college following after that. Um, he wants to be able to take care of being able to get, you know, the, the GI home loans and stuff like that. So again, they're, they're thinking practically while at the same time, not giving up on what those, what those other dreams or ambitions might be. My youngest daughter is very entrepreneurial. So here's what I would say. Take a look at, at what you think your ideal jobs are and come up with a couple, right? And then start developing the, the necessary technical skill sets to either get you in proximity or, or straight out do it if that's what it is. Right, but that you can also feed yourself with. Because this is another thing that I think has a lot of men depressed is the idea that they feel like they're never going to be able to own a home. They feel like they're never going to be able to, you know, pay off student loans. And depending on where you're at in this journey, you can take a really hard look at what culture is pushing you to do because culture is telling you, go take out a bunch of loans and then go to college and get a degree because the degree equals wealth. No, it doesn't. Skills, capability, and sometimes credentials equal wealth, right? And there's always the entrepreneurial route. So develop those professional skill sets in an area that you have genuine interest and you're not going to hate your life doing it, but that also have viable interest within the marketplace. That's another thing I'm going to, I'm going to, and this is going to hit some conservatives kind of hard because every once in a while I'll see conservatives say, we know back in the day you could work at the same company for 40 years 
and, and now you can't do that. And that's because of international trade or that's because of this. Guys, I'm going to tell you something right now. Competitive advantage is a real thing. Certain countries are set up to be able to provide certain goods and services better in, in a way that is more competitive than what we can do in the United States. So we can be frustrated by that or we can recognize it for what it is and then develop our skill sets in the areas for which we have competitive advantage in the globe. And, and now more than ever, I think it's really important that people have a variety of skill sets that have economic viability. And there is so much that you can learn how to do. We've said this before as we look for, and, and again, I'm going to go back to kind of our realm because this is something we can speak on very specifically. As we look for people that can do video editing, we are far less concerned about a piece of paper that says you know how to do it than we are your actual capabilities and whether or not you understand what our mission is. And I think more and more companies are moving in this direction. They, they want to know the credential might mean something. And, and again, in some places it might be legally required, but companies more and more are like, no, I, I want to know that you can actually work. I want to know that I'm not hiring an activist that is looking for the first excuse possible to sue me. And, I, and I'm looking for somebody that understands and is actually somewhat passionate about what the mission is, or at the very least can be appreciative for the fact that they're being given an economic opportunity and they want to excel at it for its own sake. Right? All of those things are, are super important. So on, on the professional side, the communication component, um, the, the technical skills, the third category is the practical skills. And that's, again, knowing how to do stuff that makes you more capable. Um, so for instance, um, my wife knows how to like cut hair. And now you might say to yourself, okay, is she ever like actually utilized that economically within the economy? No, she hasn't. But she's cut my hair and my kid's hair <laughs> from like forever. Now, if you were to add up all of the money that we have saved within our budget by me not having to go out every two weeks um, or the girls going out and, and gets, because she was able to do it, that's a huge economic saving to your budget. Huge economic saving to your budget. So not, not every skill set that you develop is going to automatically translate into somebody paying you for it or you getting paid as, a, as an entrepreneur for it. But it could be something that, that maybe you enjoy, maybe that's very practical, that actually saves you a lot of money. That's super important. Super important. I know a lot of people after 2020, when they walked into the grocery store and saw, oh my gosh, the shelves are bare. And it turns out I live in a country where the economy can just, or the, excuse me, where the government can just shut down the economy. I, I, I want to take a little bit of control over my own ability to raise some of my own food. It's where a lot of people got into homesteading and gardening. It, was, it wasn't because they, they thought the world was going to collapse and they were, were prepping for the end times. It was because they just never wanted to feel in a position where they couldn't feed their family potentially, not because they didn't have the money, but because they couldn't get to a store. Or when they did, the shelves were bare because of supply chain issues. So again, I, I took that as a thing. I'm going to learn more about how to raise livestock. I'm going to learn about how to garden. I've now, find, I've now found it incredibly therapeutic. I get excited about doing it. I like getting my seed starts. I like being able to not only do it for me, but to do it for other people, um, especially for people that might have dietary issues and some of the stuff they get in the store, just they react differently to it when it's like fresh and homegrown. These are all positive things that you're going to find make you more capable. Um, I'll give one other example of this. Um, Eating out is incredibly expensive and, and in many cases, not the best option for you. Learning how to cook. If you're a man, let me give you some advice. If you can learn how to cook, not only is that going to save you money, not only is it going to be better for the physical and, and the dietary thing, as long as you're, you're, you're cooking reasonable stuff. I, I, am, I am telling you, guys, women dig it. <laughs> a woman digs a guy that can cook. You don't even got to be an expert at everything. In fact, we're, we're thinking one of these days of doing something with Gina where she does a whole thing because she's, she's a trained chef on five things every guy should know how to cook. And one thing they should know how to cook to impress their lady. <laughs> I'm telling you, that is a, that is a viable skill set that has um, you know, an economic impact, whether it be out in the marketplace or, or just in your own home. And then the, the last category that I would say is work ethic. This is something that um, if you want to talk about something that older generations are always constantly frustrated about with younger generations, it's always a work ethic component. Um, 
And some of this is because many of you have grown up in schools where they've taught you that your employer's the enemy, that the you know evil corporations, blah, 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 blah. Are there evil bosses? Yes. Are there evil corporations? Sure. Right. But the person providing you a job, right, is not the bad guy. And and I love it when Marxists like to talk about, oh, well, they're getting a profit off of your you're not getting the full value of your labor. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you what, if you think that your labor is worth more, great. Either sell to somebody else that will pay you more. And if they do, then it was, you were right. And if they don't, well, then you were wrong. And whatever you were getting paid was actually the fair market value for your labor. But there's always a third option. If you think your labor is worth more, then go out, be an entrepreneur and compete with them. And if you succeed, you were right. And if you don't, you weren't, <laughs> right? So having some appreciation for the, for the opportunities that are provided by an entrepreneur that has risked something, that has, has dedicated their own labor, that instead of going out and going on a fancy trip, they decided to buy capital, which allowed them to make your labor more productive and more valuable working for them. That, that's, a, that's a good thing. So appreciating those things and appreciating that dynamic is really important and it will help you. It will actually help your work ethic because when you show up to a job, and you do a good job because you want to be an honorable person that does the best they can do. Now more than ever, I, I talk to a lot of people that employ people. And one of the things they always say that they're looking for is, is people with a strong work ethic because they see it as an act of integrity that I'm getting paid to do something and I'm going to do it well because I want to be the sort of person that does things well. And I will tell you, those people don't make minimum wage for long. They just don't. They, they get promoted. They get, they get paid more. Um, they get, because that's the sort of person you're competitive now, merely showing up on time and doing a good job at the thing that you were paid to do makes you much more competitive within the marketplace at this point. And so there, there's a huge value in, in all of those components. What, what did you want to add to that Hamilton? I would just like to speak very briefly to folks that are younger than me, because I don't know how I feel about giving, uh, you know, business and work advice to people that are 20 years ahead of me in their career. But to dive a little bit deeper on the work ethic, I think you could say that another way as a natural desire for excellence. That's yeah. another way you could put that. But there have been two things that I've been really focused on myself, and that is longevity and proper alignment of expectations. Mm. And I think that there are a couple of characteristics and people that determine what they're going to do for work and how far they're going to go with that. And one of those is a natural level of curiosity. Mm -hmm. And the thing that the trait that is shared amongst everyone on our team, the host on the podcast, our post-production editors, the trait that is shared amongst everyone is an extreme level of curiosity. And as an example, you know, Nick and Christian's curiosity is oftentimes in history, the intellectual side. Mine is in business. It's in you know, I go in these six months, six month spurts of just diving deep into various different things, whether that's content strategy, platform monetization for the past six months has been business and automation. And so I think that when it comes to properly aligning your expectations for a career, you have to think about, okay, what is my natural desire for excellence? What is my natural level of curiosity? How much time do I want to invest in my skill set? If my desire is low for overall investment and skill set, you know, I can't expect to be an entrepreneur. If I want to be the best at what I'm going to do, it requires not only sacrifice in areas that other people may enjoy, such as time with friends and family. Um, but I, I think it's important to look at your natural level of curiosity and how, it, because for me, I spend my free time watching YouTube videos about things that we do with business. I, I just, it, I'm crazy like that. I will sit down at 11 o'clock at night and watch videos on YouTube about business automation and data. And that's just kind of what I do. But because I enjoy that area, I'm so much more uh, capable of building that skill set and aligning it to the initiatives of our business and our operation. And so I think proper alignment of expectations is super important. Because at the end of the day, you may want to be an entrepreneur and own the business and run the team, but if your level of curiosity doesn't align with that and you're not willing to invest the time or not, or you don't naturally want to invest the time, you know, it's okay that you may not need to be the owner of the business and that's okay. 
No, I, I think that's I think that's an excellent point, and and he's he's absolutely right. Like Christian and I will joke that it, we'll we'll know when we'll know when Hamilton's going into one of his like deep dive cycles because we'll start getting video clips uh, from YouTube. And it was funny because for a while there, I used to. Uh, <laughs> I used to joke with him a lot, like, why are you sending me this? Can you give me some context on why you want me to view this 45 minute thing? And, um, it, but here's the crazy part. I found myself three months later, six months later, 12 months later going, you know, it was this time when Hamilton sent me this clip. Like, and at the moment I was like, dude, I don't need another thing to do. I don't need another thing to watch. But he was right. He identified something in there that was Im important. And again, I'm, you know, I'm 44 Hamilton's what, 28? 28 about to turn 29 yeah uh oh yeah that's tomorrow right uh next wednesday seven oh, okay all right i thought it was like coming right up why did I, I got it marked on my calendar wrong okay it's not that i don't care about you i just got it wrong on my calendar <laughs> but um no it, it, it it's it's true um you know, the, the managing the expectations because again i think when young men have been lied to about what actually creates wealth um Again, what what do they want you? They want you um, dumb, um, you know, emotionally immature, weak, and then when it comes to professional, they they keep telling you that well, you've been robbed by all these other people that are successful. The reason why you're not successful is because society is is you know bad or exploitive, and 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 oh by the way, because you're a man, you probably are one of the exploitive ones, unless you fall into one of the grievance categories that they attempt to exploit in other ways. And so this is why I would say that, again, part of the mission here on taking all of this back and like reclaiming masculinity is looking at those people that are trying to screw you in all these other areas and going, I don't believe you in any of these other areas. Why would I believe you in this one? Right. I no, I'm, I'm going to fight to be more capable. I'm going to fight to be more effective, either because I want to be an entrepreneur or because I want to be a skilled and respected technician that works for somebody else. And I'm going to respect the role that they played and they're going to respect the role that you play. Right, that's all super important, but I think the curiosity point is is really valid here because look, if you're someone that just wants to show up to work in order to get the paycheck so that you can go do other things, that's fine. That that might be your that may be the way you prioritize things, but then there shouldn't be the expectation of great wealth as a result of that, be, because unless unless you you know unless you got a rich uncle that's going to leave you everything. Chances are, you know, hard work doesn't equal wealth. I always said productive work equals wealth. It just turns out that productive work usually includes a lot of hard work because you've got to, you've got to engage in a certain level of mastery and, and time investment in order to achieve that. And, and I do think it's important to have work-life balance. And I certainly, I certainly work for that. There's, there's a certain degree of income I'm willing to forego to have more time with my wife and children. Um, but I still want to be good at what I do. Um, I, I want I want to be able to you know to take personal value in 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 knowing that no I'm good at this right and that takes time you got to invest in that and and again it takes time and that's going to go beyond nine to five and but if you enjoy it you don't mind it going beyond nine to five like Christian reading Christian reading history books or or watching you know whatever Kings and Generals at two in the morning it is is beneficial for work. But he's not exactly doing it purely because you know, he's not doing it because he's on the clock at that point. And I do the same thing when I'm watching, you know, things about philosophy or, or history or economics that I want to be able to, to talk about and, and, and uncover. And so that, that is an important part of the professional development is really finding something for which there is enjoyment. And then I'll, I'll add this other part because this is this is true of everything that we've talked about in the last category we are going to talk about is that motivation is an important thing. But motivation should not be necessary for a man to achieve what they need to achieve. That's where discipline comes in. And um, there's been plenty of times where I was not motivated, where, and none of us were motivated to, to do something, but we had to do it. And so what, what, do you, what do you reach for when the motivation isn't there? You reach for the discipline. Because again, a real man is someone that will continue to do what needs to be done when the motivation is gone. And that, that's an important part for all of these, not just the professional. There's something to be said about how the economic component of this is important, but it is not all encompassing. Yeah. All, um, and and here, here's what I mean by that. Material conditions, yes. You, you, you know, we all want to, to work towards, you know, bettering ourselves in that field. But go back 100 years ago, let alone like 1,000 years ago, right? 
look at the material conditions of people even 100 years ago. Yeah. Calvin Coolidge lost a son because of a splinter playing tennis because we didn't have the type of medicine available or medi- the president of the United States, yeah. right? Because we didn't have the type of medicine available. This was 100 years ago. And so, yes, working, developing a skill set in order to enhance your own material conditions is great. But for a lot of men, yes, they're, they're, they're looking to, to make sure that they're secure economically, but that is not the only reason that, that you go out there and you develop a skill set. You go out there and you develop a skill set because of the thing that I brought up earlier on how men are human doings. And sometimes we resent that. Sometimes we, we get upset about that. And there's very legitimate reasons to be upset about that because there's something within us that we want to be treated like human beings, but it is an unfortunate truth. And I do not do you any service. If I, if I lie to you about how that is not, if I lie to you and say that is not true, yeah, because it is true. And you become a better man by developing skill sets that serve you, not just in pursuit of better economic conditions, but in pursuit of becoming a better man. Mm-hmm. And skill sets to serve those around you as well. Again, we might be mad and upset about it, but it, 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 it will serve you well to understand that, that, that there is some truth in that and that you develop skill sets not just to for, you know further your career or not just to make more money or not just to buy a nice house or get a nice car you develop the skill sets in order to become the type of man that you were always meant to be I from guess, the beginning yeah. from yeah. inception you and once you recognize that that is ultimately the higher calling and purpose in this not the ultimate higher calling and purpose but in this subcategory that is the ultimate higher calling and purpose it's not to make more money making more money is is important being financially successful is important having those material conditions be met is important but that is not the pinnacle of what we're talking about here when it comes to to reaching that pinnacle it's about developing a skill set that makes you the most capable man that you were always meant to be from the start and A lot of that depends on what your interests are in. So somebody like Hamilton, for example, became very capable when it came to video editing and, you know, film and and entrepreneurship and and, well, not even just entrepreneurship in an ethereal sense, but but building and running a business. The reason that Hamilton doesn't chime in every single waking second on the podcast like I do (laughs) is because he's busy working in the business yeah or sorry he's he's busy work well at first he was working in the business but now he's working on the business not yeah. in the business all the time yeah he started working in the business now he's working on it and a lot of the stuff that he does behind the scenes is the reason why we're able to keep the lights on and actually record this podcast he's developed a skill set that's enabled him to do it part of the reason that the why minutes have become what it is is because i developed a skill set when it came to research and writing mm-hmm. And we're, we're going to eventually launch another YouTube channel where we're going to hopefully try to do the same thing. And we'll talk more about some of these historical or geographic or economic topics in a more in-depth sense. But that came about from a skill set of <laughs> yeah. being able to, to discern information and articulate it and write about it. And those are things that take time to develop, but they are very rewarding. And they're very rewarding even outside of just instantly making money. Yeah. Like... Let me tell you, when somebody comes back and they read something that you wrote and they're like, man, that's really profound. Or somebody comes back and they look at a video that you that you made or something that you filmed and they say or a um, automated system that you created. Yeah. Hamilton loves automated systems. Right? <laughs> when somebody comes back and they say, wow, that's pretty incredible. You brought something to the table. That's fulfilling. Yeah. And it means it, 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 what it is, it's, it's a sign that you are moving in the in the right direction that you were developing those skills that again enable you to become the best type of man that you were always meant to be so i i just wanted to stress that because there's there's so much emphasis on just get a good career and just you know get the house and the white picket fence and the and the car and and money 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 i'm not saying it's not important i love capitalism but there's this gnawing sense this this The book of Matthew says it best when it says that, you know, man cannot live off of bread alone. Mm -hmm. And what they're saying, what Matthew is saying when he says man cannot live off of bread alone is bread is substitute for material conditions, economic progress and money. It's not just literal bread. What what he's saying is, is that it is you do not exist to operate within a free trade zone. 
free trade zones might be important and valuable and you might want to fight for them within the political arena. You, you might want to fight for property rights and capitalism and stuff like that. I, I support all of that. But we do not exist as human beings just to produce economic output. Yeah. We exist as human beings to cultivate a skill set and to develop ourselves as men to contribute something to the world because that is who we are. We are human doings. It sucks that some that, that, that some people don't see inherent value and worth in us as human beings. But you know what? You still have an opportunity to prove them wrong. Yeah. You still have an opportunity to say, no, I do have value and worth. Here's the exa- here's the fruits of my labor. I, I think they're um, and this kind of leads us into the, the final category that we're going to talk about. Um, and, and I think this is the most important category. Uh, it's also the one we get the most pushback from people on. Because they, and, and I and I, we've seen it. People have said, oh, I, I like what you say on the intellectual. I like what you say on the emotional. I like what you say on the physical. I like what you say on the professional. I just wish you'd kind of like, you know, can it a little bit on the spiritual side. And the thing I've said before is like, I, I don't know, I don't know how to do that. And I want, and I'm not interested in doing that because I don't think it's actually an accurate or honest depiction of what it is that we're advocating for, what we think truly works. Um, Hamilton, a while back, like you had a, a question that kind of, I think, teased this up really well. Yeah. To, to, to tie in the emotional topic that we discussed, the physical and the economical topics, I going back to what I said about properly aligning expectations, I think it's really important to ask, especially for the young men who are lacking that emotional drive, that intensity that we would want, that Nick, we see you have with your family and everything that you work for. I think we have to ask the question of, will having a great career and a lot of money make me happy? Will being married make me happy? Will having kids make me happy? Because there are a lot of people that have all of those things and are terribly unhappy. And so for those of us who are in the situation of not being married, don't have kids, don't have a great career, all of those things, and we feel that those things can't be attained, like they're not even in reach. But I would ask you to ask yourself, if you do reach those things, will they give you the fulfillment that you want? And Nick, you talk about, um, I believe it's Philippians 4, 7 quite often, the peace that surpasses all understanding. And that peace that comes when you have fully dedicated your life to Christ and what he would have for you is something that cannot be attained by any worldly measure. And I also think that when you do have that peace that surpasses all understanding, that is inspired by the Holy Spirit in you, your desire for fulfillment from these worldly ambitions should disappear. So let me let me see if I can... Um... I think it's it's a it's a great question and a statement. Um, I want to I want to throw one other kind of perspective on that. Um, I think a lot of people have again wh- wh- where we miss the mark is where we focus on. If you just do this, then you'll find fulfillment. If you just do this, then you'll be happy. If you just do this, and and that tends to focus around things like the okay. If you're again, so the opposite of being you know dumb, depressed, um, weak and poor is, is obviously being, you know, smart, confident, you know, strong and wealthy, right? So those things will, those things will, you know, make me happy. And and then I'll get the, and, and, and if that's not happy in of itself, I don't want to be a materialist, right? I don't want to be a, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not just a, you know, focused on myself. I want to help others. So then when I, when I get the wife and then when I get the kids and that, that's, what's going to provide the ultimate fulfillment, right? That's, that's what these guys are telling me. No, that's, that's not what we're telling you. It's, um, there has to be something more to all of that because what you're going to end up finding is, is that it, it's actually horribly unfair, um, to look at another person, whether it be a wife or a child and look at them with the responsibility that it's like, it's, it's your job to make me happy. It's your job to complete me uh, in the way that I, I need to be completed in the way that it needs to give me familiar. That's your job. That's your, no, it isn't. Um, now what you're going to find is those relationships when properly understood and built upon a strong foundation do provide you a lot of meaning and purpose. 
but it can't be the ultimate source of it because otherwise you're, you're, you're putting an impossible task on somebody else. And that just begs the question, well, do they have the same right to expect that of you? So here's what I would say. The reason why the spiritual is so important, and again, I am a Christian, and so I don't advocate for generic God. I don't, I don't advocate for deism. I, I advocate for Christianity. I advocate for Christ. Is because I found that to be true. You can do with that what you want. Like ultimately, ultimately, my job is not to convert you. It's not my job. Uh, my job is to be obedient to my own purpose, and my job is to advocate for the truth. And and to and to do so with love and respect. And sometimes I fall short of that. A lot of times I fall short of that. But to to Hamilton's point, the first thing that you need to figure out, and some people will ask, well, if this is the first thing, why didn't we discuss it first? Well, because I purposefully wanted people to consider the other things before we considered this one. And, and hopefully that was the right thing to do. Because if you liked what we set up to this point, I'm hoping you'll, you'll give us a hearing on this one, even if you weren't inclined to. The reason why this is so important is because ultimately the source of reality, the source of objective truth rests on this question. If it doesn't, then everything else is, is extended in midair. You're just hoping it works out. You're just hoping it works out. But if you can answer those fundamental questions for yourself, if you, if you can say, like, I, I believe that this is true, and you have good evidence to support that it's true, then from there you can build everything else. You don't, you don't build a house. You don't build a house by starting with the master bedroom. You don't build a house by starting with the kitchen. You start it with the foundation. And if the foundation is solid, you now have something for which you can build everything else. And if the foundation is weak, I don't care how nice the, the, the superstructure is, it's going to collapse eventually, probably when it gets hard. And so the whole point of what is the peace that surpasses all understanding mean? And this is one of those things within Christianity that I found incredibly valuable. Is that what I get from my faith, right? And this is not just a transactional thing where I do this because it seems to work. There's a lot of times where something other than Christianity feels like it would work a whole lot easier than what I believe is true. But because I believe it's true, what I get is a completely solid, unassailable sense of identity, purpose, and meaning with my relationship with God, which nobody else can add to or take away from. That relationship in and of itself provides identity, purpose, and meaning. It also provides love and a sense of justice. And these are all things that I would say human beings in general crave and desire. And there are people out there that have lived their entire life without getting married. Does that mean that somehow th their life has been less meaningful or they've failed somehow? No. That might have been what they were called to do. That might have been their purpose is that in order to focus on certain things, that was not something that they were able to accomplish. That's why that, that relationship with Christ is so essential. Is because within that, if, if, if identity, meaning, and purpose, love and justice are fully contained within that, and so you can pursue truth and you can pursue these other things, then no matter how bad it gets, you don't question who you are or why you're here. Now, let me ask you something. Would you rather form relationships, whether they be friendships, whether they be professional, whether they be marital, would you rather form a relationship with somebody who is absolutely confident in their identity and their purpose, but also loves you and wants to go through life together? Or would you rather form it with somebody that has this expectation that you have some sort of obligation to complete them? That's an easy answer for me. That is an easy answer for me. So I, I want people to understand that this is not just, this is not flying spaghetti monster. It's not sky daddy. It's not, you know, mystical Santa. That's, it's not any of those things. That's not what God is. That's not what Christ is. That's not what Christianity is. You are going to have to answer the question of what it is that you believe on a fundamental level. And if you're starting off that question with, well, well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know about any of that stuff, but I do know that this stuff works. And so I'm just going to do it. Okay. Until you, you, at some point you're going to hit a crisis where all of a sudden just the, the answer of, well, I, this just stuff kind of worked. Well, what happens when it doesn't work for you? 
Science, it turns out, logic itself can't ultimately justify its own existence. So even if you're someone that believes, well, I just believe in logic, or I just believe in the scientific method. Okay, great. Those things presuppose other things. Those things don't ultimately explain objective truth or objective reality. They certainly don't explain objective morality. So when we talk about things here that are good and noble and worth fighting for and potentially worth dying for, we're actually assigning a value to that, which we say it's objectively true and it's objectively good. Where does that come from? Because it's not coming from billions of years ago, there was nothing and then it exploded and then we had matter and then we had living matter and then we had living intelligent matter. And now we have living, intelligent, moral matter with no ultimate meaning or purpose. Sorry, that does not find, that does not provide a foundation for what we're talking about when we're talking about seeking out the objectively good. But Christianity does, and and I feel that it, I feel that when it is properly studied with an intention to understand, as opposed to an intention to just malign or ridicule or laugh at or mock when it's actually studied with the intention of understanding don't you don't do don't got to believe it to begin that process i think what people generally find is that they find truth there not just from the historicity of it not just from the early attestation and the reliability of scripture but they actually find truth in it in speaking to something within the human condition that we all know is there it's this desire for love and justice and I think that story, that above all, that story of God creating us in an environment where it was perfect, and there was one rule, just don't do this one thing, but then giving us the will to choose to do something else. Because this is the question I've always asked. Can you truly have love and justice, the two, thing, two things that no matter where people are, philosophically, theologically, two people that they, everyone seems to strive for, everyone seems to agree on some level that is, it is inherently good, is love and justice. Can you honestly have that in a society where God just creates you to be an automaton that dances exactly to his will? Or do you have to be able to have the choice to decide to do something different? Well, if we value love, if we value justice, then on some level we've got to understand we had to have the ability to choose something else. We can't then value our freedom and be furious because God gave it to us and we somehow make, and we sometimes make bad decisions that don't only impact us, they impact other people as well who didn't deserve to be impacted that way. So all I'm going to say is that when you have figured out, when you, when you have decided for yourself and you've, you've arrived at the truth, it is providing the core things that you absolutely have to have, I believe, to really seek out genuine fulfillment, meaning, purpose, and identity. And that puts you in a great position to be able to pursue these other things that we've talked about, to maybe be able to achieve a level of mastery at them, but perhaps more than anything, it provides the foundation for when things are bad or when you fail or when you feel defeated or when everybody else is aligned against you, but you are confident in what you know to be both loving and true and just, you're willing to stand up to it no matter what. And you're always willing to get back up. And if you want to know what truly makes a man, it's when they are absolutely dedicated to truth and they will fight for it no matter what, all the way up to and including their life for it. That is the sort of man we have always admired. That's the sort of man that is the husband that his wife can depend upon, love, and cherish. That's the sort of man that his children can look up to. That's the sort of man which builds societies. And that's the sort of man we desperately need right now. And ultimately, regardless of whatever else is going on in society, you get to choose whether or not you want to be that man. They can punish you for it. They can ridicule for you. They can even arrest you for it. One day they might even be able to kill you for it. But they can't take the choice away from you. That belongs to you. And our hope is, is that more people are going to choose to do it. Understanding that there's going to be flaws along the way, challenges along the way. They're not always going to live up to the best of expectation or even their own. 
But when they get back up and they continue to pursue it, there is nobility in that journey. We hope you guys found this useful. Uh, We hope if you're a young man out out there, we hope you're encouraged by this. If you're an older man out there and um, I'm I'm getting into that thing where my my beard's getting a little bit grayer, um, I hope that we will all be capable of not simply standing by and giving advice or dictating to younger men what they should be doing or what they shouldn't be doing or how they should be feeling about circumstances that, quite frankly, we're not as close to as they are. At some point, we had other men that forced us to be better, but at some point, we're willing to listen to what it is that we were going through so they could help us navigate that. We now need to be that for this upcoming generation. And some of that is going to include shutting up and listening so that we can properly understand the operational environment they find themselves in so that we can then share the wisdom of our experiences, both from the things we got right and the things we got wrong, so that we can help them navigate this and come through it on the other side even better than we were. And that should be our goal as older men. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next episode.